Welcome to today's webinar, Dementia Care During the COVID-19 Pandemic Strategies for Success. My name is David Troxell, and I'm the co-author of the Best Friends Approach to Dementia Care, and I'm delighted to be a consultant to Trilogy and its BFF Memory Care program. You'll learn more about this in a few minutes. Uh, I, I've worked around the world and am known for my teaching and writing about dementia care, and I've co-authored six books about Alzheimer's disease with my friend and writing partner, Virginia Bell. Uh, I also have been a family care partner. My mother, Dorothy, passed away in 2008 with Alzheimer's, and uh, she actually lived in assisted living memory care for three years. So I've, in many ways, traveled this caregiving journey, not only as a professional, but also as a family member. And I'm so pleased to partner with Trilogy because they actually are a licensed provider of the best friends approach. And what we hope you'll believe and see is a life affirming and innovative program. So in today's presentation, I'm going to offer a brief overview of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. Uh, there's a lot of interesting news out there to share. Uh, and I hope you'll learn again, some fundamentals about the healthcare considerations of being a caregiver and, and really making sure your person stays as healthy as possible. We'll take a look at some contemporary best practices about life story work, music, exercise, and what I like to call communication and communication with heart. Uh, my goal again today, uh, many of you are, are getting through this pandemic at home, uh, direct caregivers to family members. Some of you have uh, family members at Trilogy or in other settings. My goal today will be to give you a toolkit that you can use every day to, to make things a bit better for yourself and for your family member. We'll talk about Trilogy's memory care program and their use of the best friends approach. And two, I think very, very exciting and interesting uh, parts of the Trilogy program, uh, their activity and engagement program called Daily Rhythms and their adaptation of my work, the Best Friends Approach, which I think is very clever. They call it the BFF program in honor of Best Friends Forever. And you'll be hearing more about that today during the webinar. And of course, we have to talk about the ongoing pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has been so devastating for all of us in this field of long-term care, for many of us as family members. I'm gonna talk though today about how the medical model and the social model don't have to conflict with each other. And there's a lot we can do to still provide connection, warmth, empathy, and, and to help again, uh, support the person's emotional well-being and physical health, even during this crisis. And then there'll be some time uh, for you to hit a, a link and uh, get your questions answered. We'll be following up. Uh, if you have any questions, this is really for you today. And again, thank you to my friends at Trilogy for making this available. And now I'd like you to meet the man who started this whole thing off, Dr. Alzheimer. He was a very renowned physician working in Germany in the early 1900s, a pathologist. He had a keen interest in what they would have called back then lunacy. Now, what causes this odd aberrant behavior? Uh, is it something in the water? Is it, is it witchcraft? Is it food? Is it diet? Well, Dr. Alzheimer was a very progressive man, and he thought there was a link between the brain and behavior, which of course we now know is true. And he was doing his work when he met this woman on the right, Augusta. In an odd twist of fate, she was only 51, what we would today call a younger onset person living with dementia. But her husband brings, him in to see, brings her in to see the doctor, and he describes the symptoms as she's getting lost in familiar neighborhoods. She has delusions, these fixed false ideas very, very forgetful. And in fact, we even have Dr. Alzheimer's clinical notes. And Dr. Alzheimer, in his notes, she says to him, Doctor, I have lost myself. So we can see that this face of Augusta is a sad face. She clearly is depressed, likely malnourished. She, she looks a lot older than 51. And, and I think it's fair to say that this face of Alzheimer's disease is even with us today. You know, there are people living with Alzheimer's, particularly toward the end of their lives, who, who really uh, have this very sad uh, face and, and who I think have despair, that this doesn't have to be the face of Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot we can do to lift this face up and to uh, give people living with dementia a better quality of life. And now we're going to turn to a discussion of Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias. And I want to introduce you to probably the number one most downloaded handout from the Alzheimer's Association, their 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. Uh, the first one we're also familiar with, memory loss that disrupts daily life, challenges in planning or solving problems, difficulty completing familiar tasks, confusion with time and place, 
trouble understanding visual images or spatial relationships. A person living with Alzheimer's might pick up a fork and actually miss their mouth. Uh, these are some of the things we see with Alzheimer's disease. New problems with words when speaking and writing, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps, decreased or poor judgment, withdrawal from work and social activities, and changes in mood and personality. One reason why I like this slide so much is because so many of us associate Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias with memory loss, and this certainly is the number one symptom, but this, is a, this slide's a good reminder of just the world of, of dementia and all the things we're living with. For example, number eight, Sadly, many people living with dementia can become victimized by, you know, fake Canadian lotteries or, or phone calls or these fake IRS phone calls. It may not be safe for them to be by themselves living at home if they're still in control of their own funds and money. So be aware that these are some of the warning signs. If a person you're concerned about uh, has some of these warning signs, you want to get them to the neurologist and make sure they have a good medical workup and evaluation. If you have an, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease for your family member, uh, let's talk about just a few of the tools that are available right now. There are some classic dementia medications, and let me put these up on the screen for you to take a look at. Aricept, Exelon, Grazidine, and Namenda. These are the current basic drugs for Alzheimer's disease, and they're very modest in what they do, but the good news is they have very few side effects. The first three, Aricept, Exelon, and Razidine, are what we call cholinesterase inhibitors, and they give those neurotransmitters in the brain a boost. The fourth drug is actually an old German drug called Namenda, and it's often given in combination with the first three. Now, these medications probably are effective between 12 and 18 months. Uh, again, with about a third of the people, it may lift them up a little bit, have them perform a bit better. Uh, another third, perhaps it keeps them at the status quo, which is actually quite helpful if they're not declining. Uh, finally, I would say in another third of people, these medicines don't seem to have much impact. We desperately need some new medications because if you look at this slide carefully, you'll see that the last drug was approved by the FDA in 2003, which means it's almost been 20 years since we've had a new medication for Alzheimer's disease. This has really been, I think, quite a debacle in so many ways. We, we've put so much uh, research funding into our, our drug discovery pipeline, and it has not proved to give us many dividends yet. But I am hopeful, and in fact, there's a, a new drug pending approval with the FDA called aducanumab, and it actually may be the first disease-modifying drug that might actually help uh, slow this disease down. The Alzheimer's Association has done a terrific job raising money for research, uh, we recently had 33,000 people attend the International Alzheimer's Research Conference virtually, and many of those young doctors, researchers, PhDs, PhD candidates are all devoting their lives to Alzheimer's disease research. I'm very optimistic that in the near future we will have more news and more medications down the path. This is a really terrific slide that I think is very important for any of us to take a look at who are family members. Because even though I've said that there's no medicine that truly impacts Alzheimer's disease, we know that Alzheimer's disease often comes with other treatable challenges that left untreated can worsen impairment. So if you look on the right, this is a list of, of, of items we wanna be aware of as a family member that can impact your person's thinking and cognition. So particularly if you have a family member who's living by themselves and many people who are getting demented still live alone at home, of course, we're concerned about making sure they're safe. Well, they may be taking their medications all wrong. They may be taking four of this, six of that. Uh, they may not be taking their medications at all or maybe over-the-counter meds that are bad for the brain. So you want to check their medications, be aware of that. Alcohol, stroke, depression and pain, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, malnutrition, are they eating well? Are they eating all carbs? Are they eating all sweets? Uh, are, they, are they getting a good diet? This can impact the brain. Hormone deficiencies, thyroid issues, blood sugar, diabetes. There's actually a lot of interest in recent years about untreated diabetes and high levels of blood sugar as being an enemy of the brain. And particularly if your family member is pre-diabetic or has diabetes, if they're not controlling this, again, this can actually worsen cognition. 
uh, hearing, visual impairments, uh, maybe their glasses are dirty or they're wearing the wrong glasses, maybe their hearing aid battery has failed. Uh, this can isolate the person and further worsen their confusion. And of course, B12 deficiencies, uh, D, uh, vitamin D deficiencies, these are all enemies of the brain. And this last one I think is particularly important for this discussion today because we know that loneliness and isolation, even before COVID was a huge issue for many of our elders. And now with COVID and this social distancing, this can become a huge issue. So we wanna figure out some strategies to try to keep them engaged in life. And you'll hear a bit about that in a moment with the Trilogy program, which I think is very focused on engagement. And this is so important for the brain. So I'm gonna talk now about depression because this is a very fascinating area. And it turns out that there's actually research dating back to the 1950s that people who have long held histories of clinical depression uh, may get Alzheimer's disease or cognitive illness earlier in life. We also know that a lot of people living with dementia have accompanying depression. So it's quite common and you wanna watch for it. You, you can almost sense when someone's depressed, you know, they're not doing the things they've always done. Maybe the, 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 the cat jumps up on their lap and they kind of have a flat affect. They're not really paying attention to that. So if you suspect depression, talk to your doctor. The antidepressant medication in older people aren't too bad. Uh, they can be effective. But you also wanna surround the person the best you can with meaningful activity, time out of doors, animals and music. And, and staff who make that emotional connection, expressing affection and friendship, or certainly family members around who can kind of help lift them up and help them feel connected. Again, depression is an enemy of the brain. If you don't treat it, it tends to worsen cognition. Pain. This is such a tough one for me to talk about in so many ways because there's evidence that pain often is missed, that it goes unreported. And this is kind of a heartbreak for me, thinking about people with dementia who are already fairly fragile and not very resilient, that if they have pain that is, is being missed or not being treated, again, it drags everybody down. And if you think about this for a minute, you see, you know, I don't have dementia. And if I wake up one morning and I have a terrible toothache, you know, one of my teeth is uh, really beginning to blow up on me. I can tell I have an infection, something going on. I know to call my dentist and say, hey, I'm really in a lot of pain. Can you fit me in? It's urgent. And hopefully I'll be able to get to my dentist and get my problem treated. Well, let's say you have somebody with Alzheimer's disease, you know, your aunt, your, your mother, your, your husband, wife, or partner, and, and they begin to have this tooth pain. They may not be able to name it. They may not be able to say, nurse, I need to go I need to go to a dentist. Instead, they just live with this pain and it gradually, gradually becomes debilitating and affects lots of behavior. This is the situation where someone might suddenly slap you or refuse food or refuse personal care. So watch this out. And one of the clues and keys is sudden changes. My, my mom's neurologist was, was really quite a, a deep thinker. And he said, you know, David, Alzheimer's disease is like a slow and lazy river. You know, it tends to be progressive. Most of these dementias tend to be progressive and slow. So sudden changes don't mean that mom has gone into another stage of Alzheimer's last night at 10 o'clock. It means that she's ill, that something's going on. So watch for these sudden changes. And again, you can have some sort of simple tests, you know, observation, you know, if they're, if they're not doing the things they've always done, if it's been a sudden change, if you're helping them get dressed and they're, they're wincing or they're, they're crying out and, you know, you're moving their body parts and they're, 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 they're agitated, this can be a concern. Moaning sounds. Uh, uh, one little interesting clue or, or, or idea is if someone's making some audible moaning sounds or noises, you give them their favorite ice cream they're happy for 15, 20 minutes, and then the sound starts up right again. That almost always is pain. If for two or three or four hours, they, they aren't in pain at all, that probably means that, or they're not making those noises or the moaning sounds, then they probably aren't in pain. And you wanna be a detective, see what's happening. And I will say that a good geriatrician will, will often tell you that if you don't know what's going on and you suspect pain, maybe try one of these over-the-counter analgesics, like you know maybe time-release Tylenol or something. It might be a chronic pain from arthritis or other things. And this can, again, sometimes reduce dementia-related behavior and increase happiness. Now, psychotropic meds could be a, 
a whole other discussion for us today. And I just want to primarily do a shout out to my friends at Trilogy because they definitely subscribe to the philosophy that hugs are better than drugs and that many behaviors can be addressed with creative teamwork and the environment and programming and care. We don't want to just sedate people when they're having problems because the problem with these psychotropic meds, these, these heavy duty meds that are sometimes used to combat paranoia or agitation or aggression, is that they don't work all that well. It's hard to get it right, the dosage, the medication, uh, often they, they just don't work. And on top of that, they have significant side effects. They have a greater risk of falling down. And some of the medications, for example, the atypical antipsychotics, they actually have a cardiovascular risk. So again, uh, be a detective, look for things. I mean, maybe you have a situation at home where mom's getting a bit paranoid or agitated late in the afternoon. Perhaps the house is too dark. Open up the curtains, improve the lightings, reduce clutter. Maybe she's seeing things with, you know, stacks of books and papers. So again, in this case, you might be able to solve it with an environmental fix versus a medication. So as we think about, you know, what is the treatment for dementia, I'm going to put it to you that in many ways, socialization is the treatment for Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. And, and I'm so pleased when I, when I talk to my friends at Trilogy that in their program, they're determined to create a day filled with music, art, exercise, conversation, good food, time outdoors on, on nice days, and a staff that, that shows smiles and affections. And what's so interesting is many of these approaches actually have an evidence base. We know, for example, that music lives in a different part of the brain than words and language. We know that exercise is very effective. We know that many people with dementia are creative and enjoy art. And you do these things to build a very good day, as I'm about to share with you. Well, what is a good day, a trilogy, or for any of us? I think it's a day spent with friends, uh, a day doing things, a, a day where we feel productive and energized and can do healthy things. And of course, during the pandemic, we've all been very challenged. We, we, we are a bit more distant from our friends and family. We have to be uh, more careful about our connections with people. I think that this is something those of us who live in our own homes or apartments, we can kind of manage the best we can. But when someone's living with Alzheimer's disease, particularly when they're living in assisted living or in a nursing home, they need us to kind of push the start button and to be proactive in, in supporting their, their, not only their physical health, but their mental health and their, their spiritual well-being. I'm so pleased to tell you about Trilogy's distinctive and life-affirming BFF program, which forms a foundational piece of their memory care efforts. Through our BFF program, we learn the unique story of each person we serve and use that story to inform every aspect of care. We help our residents cook their favorite recipes, listen to their favorite songs, express themselves creatively, and exercise their bodies and minds. By doing so, we help them to find joy, both in memories that have passed and in present experiences. Uh, BFF, I think, is very life-affirming, positive. I know the staff so enjoy having a best friend as a resident and helping our residents, particularly during this pandemic period, feel connected to one another and, and expressing that friendship and affection is, is so powerful. Trilogy also has, as one of its hallmarks, a program called Daily Rhythms. And I'm very impressed by, I think, this industry-leading activity program. Uh, at Trilogy, um, they look at activities for the whole day uh, to create a schedule based on the residents' energy throughout the day, their energy levels. Uh, the Daily Rhythms program includes both structured activities and unstructured moments that allow for natural conversation. For example, a word game could lead to a discussion of, of a childhood memory, a favorite childhood memory. Maybe a word game is being played and the answer is meatloaf. The staff at Trilogy will now pause and talk about meatloaf recipes, what makes a good meatloaf, and maybe discuss that, getting, getting people's hunger up before lunch. Again, the Daily Rhythms program is very impressive because it follows the residents' lead and acknowledges their reality. It's there for them. It's not us imposing something on them. And this is a great slide, kind of looking at this uh, daily rhythm piece uh, a little bit more carefully. And you can see that like all of us, people with dementia have highs and lows during the day. They have periods of great activity, periods of rest. And you can begin to see that a trilogy, this daily rhythm programs includes a nice open breakfast made to order, creative cooking, 
uh, in non-pandemic times, uh, family-style meals, they've adapted that as of, of late. Uh, but time to relax and recharge. I love the phrase artisans, where we're creating art and, and interesting projects, group games, music, again, a, a meal, a good meal, and, and a nighttime tradition, maybe getting ready for the next day, having a little wind down discussion, and a gathering of friends. So you'll see this very innovative activity program with interesting activities that are inviting and engaging for the residents. And I'll just give you a simple example. Uh, uh, on the calendar is a, a, a often something called creative cooking because after, after all food becomes and remains an important thing for people living with dementia and for all of us. And in this case, they might be doing creative cooking for the local hounds, for the, for the pet shelter. Perhaps that particular trilogy building and memory care neighborhood it will adopt the local ASPCA or the local uh, you know, uh, Golden Retriever Rescue Society. And, and bake dog biscuits for them. And, and what I like about this activity is all the residents in, in a small group right now, but normally in a larger group, can get their hands into the dog biscuit dough, roll it out, cut them out, bake them. They feel purposeful, they feel productive. And of course, in, in better days, we can even have residents go to the local animal shelter and deliver the dog biscuits. We all have a need to be needed, as do our residents at Trilogy. This best friends approach embraced by Trilogy, I, I have to say, could not be more timely now during the pandemic because Trilogy understands that loneliness is an enemy of the brain, that isolation is not good for the brain or good for people living with dementia. And, and so in addition to these structured activities on the calendar, uh, they, they work with staff about the value of friendship, of kindness, of giving compliments, of knowing people's life stories and being there for them. And, and when we create this, this, this community of friends, the person living with dementia, the residents of Trilogy feel safe, secure, and valued. Uh, they're engaged in purposeful and fun activities. Everything goes better. And this best friends approach to Trilogy can reduce some of the challenging behaviors because again, boredom is the enemy, activity is very positive, and we find that the residents actually thrive with a best friends environment. And now let's turn our attention to what I think we all could agree is the topic of the day, the pandemic, and how this has impacted our relationship with family members living with dementia and care in general. As somebody with a public health background, I have to say that I remain very optimistic that a vaccine will be there soon for us. I think we will come through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But meanwhile, here are some strategies for you to, to travel this journey with your family member right now. I think first and foremost, I'd like to encourage you to turn off the television or, or reduce, reduce your TV watching and screen out troubling news. You know, most of us without dementia, we can um, certainly balance our news sources. We can reflect on a story, try to understand its significance, do more research. But the person living with Alzheimer's disease, a, a little worry can grow into a big worry. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're not surrounded by this ongoing onslaught of negativity and television news. Do your best to screen out the troubling news uh, because they are very sensitive to the mood of the room. And if you're stressed and anxious, they will be stressed and anxious as well. Uh, this is also a very interesting time to embrace some key elements of memory care and to think about doing some things that might be helpful for your family member. At, at Trilogy, one of the hallmarks of their program and the hallmarks of my own work around best friends is that care partners, all of us, need to know and honor and use our family member's life story quite a bit. If your mom was a nurse, you want to talk to her about her nursing career, maybe give her a clipboard and you know, have her make some rounds with you or give you some medical advice. If your dad won the Teacher of the Year Award, you want to talk to him about that and, and honor that memory and evoke those good times. So this is a great time if you're a family member to write up a little mini memoir about your family member, write up a little you know, quick story or one page or about their life. And this way, if they ever do have to go to the hospital or move into assisted living, you'll already have a head start on these key elements because our staff at Trilogy, we need to know and celebrate the person's life story. We wanna know about some of their early memories. Did they grow up on a farm or did they grow up on, in Brooklyn? 
Uh, let's talk about career and family, awards, accomplishments, their, their religion or spirituality can be a key factor for them. And certainly any rituals and personal preferences. For me, I need to have my cup of coffee every day and you wanna know the person's morning rituals. So this COVID pandemic, again, is a good time to create a little mini memoir for your family. And to tell you how simple this can be, I want you to meet my mother, Dorothy. I wanted to kind of give her a little shout out or honor her today. Uh, she passed away in 2008 with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but here she is living in Paris in the 1950s. And my mom and dad lived in Paris for about five years back then. And uh, I love this picture because uh, my mother and father, as far as I can tell, didn't really have much money, but my mom always had a new outfit on in every picture. But the, the thing I want you to look at is on the left, this, this tin of Earl Grey tea. My mother was Canadian and she had a long time ritual of having Earl Grey tea with milk. And let me tell you, when she moved into memory care assisted living, I made sure the staff knew this about her. And when she was having a bad day, the staff would often say, Dorothy, how about I pour you a lovely cup of Earl Grey tea with milk, just the way you like it. And ah, she felt, calm, she felt peace, she felt that the staff knew her and that she knows them and it definitely created moments of happiness for her. So again, we, we want to ideally, I think, know a hundred things about everybody living with Alzheimer's if I'm the professional caregiver, but sometimes even just a, a few key elements can be so successful. So be sure that any staff you hire at the day center, in-home help, or of course assisted living settings, that they know a lot about your family member. Now, I've mentioned music briefly, but I want to talk a bit more about how important music is for the brain and for all of us. It turns out that song lyrics and music live in a different part of the brain than words and language. And I'm sure you've noticed that your family member knows all those old songs. Music is a key element of quality dementia care. I'm so pleased that Trilogy builds this into their daily rhythms activity program. And, and I know that uh, the staff at Trilogy um, have been somewhat inspired by this brilliant man, Dr. Oliver Sachs, who passed away a couple of years ago, a renowned neurologist who wrote a lot about music in the brain. Here's one of his very famous books. And I love this quote, just to again, sort of set up the importance of music, that music can lift us out of depression or move us to tears. But for many of my neurological patients, music is even more. It can provide access, even when no medication can, to movement, to speech, to life. For them, for, for elders, music is not a luxury, but a necessity. So again, one thing I'd encourage you to do during this COVID time is double down, triple down on music, make sure your family member has access to music throughout the day. Maybe consider one of those internet connected, Wi-Fi, Amazon, or Google speakers. You can go into mom's room and say, you know, Siri, play Frank Sinatra, or Google, play Frank Sinatra, or Nat King Cole, or Dolly Parton, Country Western, whatever it is. And this, again, I think creates happiness and actually reduces stress, reduces anxiety. Let's talk about exercise. This is such an interesting area because more and more we have an evidence base that exercise is so good for the brain and so good for the body. In fact, the Alzheimer's Association, they often talk about prevention these days. They say what's good for the heart is good for the head. And of all the evidence out there of things that we can do that might delay the onset of Alzheimer's, exercise is number one. And so at Trilogy, I'm so pleased that they have exercise as a regular part of their programming because again, not only is it good for the brain and the body for all of us, but when you have Alzheimer's, there's some evidence that may delay or slow down your symptoms. So we recommend exercise twice a day is good for the body and good for the brain. And COVID care can include exercise in rooms, exercise using these sort of stretchy therabands, uh, indoor walks or walks in the garden, keep them active. It's great for fall prevention and it does lift the mood to be out there and, and walk as much as you can. This is also a time, as you know, of great loss with the country dealing with the pandemic. But it's also a time, I think, to reflect on you know, what makes us uh, human beings, uh, what, what draws us to each other. And I think some of the elements of, of really connecting to the person living with cognitive loss. And I love this quote from Maya Angelou that I know has been an inspiration to many of us in the field. She, she didn't write this quote about Alzheimer's disease, but I think it's so relevant that Maya wrote that I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. 
So this is a great time again during the COVID crisis, even through your face masks to express emotion and warmth, communicate with words and gestures, your tone of voice, show affection. I, I know uh, we all wanna give authentic compliments and lift people up. I was with someone with Alzheimer's right before the pandemic broke and I was very fond of them. We had a lot of you know, nice times together. And I remember one time I said to Joan, I said, you know, Joan, what would I do without you? And this kind of affirming word, she, she was very touched by that. You could see that it, it lifted her spirits. So, so think about Maya's words and, and, and be emotive with your family member and make sure they know that they're, they're valued and loved. Let's talk about something else that I think can be a, a fun thing for all of us during this pandemic right now, uh, lifelong learning. And actually, this is happening all over. I know that lots of people are taking online classes. Uh, you can Zoom into a class from Harvard or Yale or watch it online. You can, you can visit museums all over the world. Uh, you can practice your French or Spanish. And this is something very good for all of us, good for our cognition, good for our spirits. And actually it's also, believe it or not, good for people living with dementia because people with dementia still enjoy the experience of learning. Uh, so, you know, look at their history and consider teaching a class or discussing meaningful topics. It builds self-esteem, it builds that sense of accomplishment. So during COVID, maybe you wanna, you know, with mom and dad, or those of you who may be even in a professional setting, create a series of weekly themes or discussion. Maybe something meaningful to your family member. Your family member grew up in Brooklyn or Queens, New York. Uh, maybe do uh, uh, YouTube videos of New York City or, you know, teach a little class on the Big Apple and Big Apple trivia and Broadway and uh, a New York hot dog or a New York slice of pizza. Uh, perhaps you want to talk about Columbia University in New York City because maybe your uncle went to Columbia. Uh, and you can also go a little bit far afield. Maybe your family member has a, a, a deep uh, faith and they're Roman Catholic. Why not go to Rome online and, and visit the Vatican, visit the Vatican Museum online? Uh, perhaps your family member, again, loves Italian food. Well, look at YouTube videos and recipes. So again, the idea here, and this is certainly something that is very much embraced in the Daily Rhythms Program at Trilogy, is to keep learning as long as we can. Now, the person with dementia, and this can be a bit heavy to listen to, but I think it's still important to say, maybe an hour after you've taught a class on Paris, France, or Rome, or New York City, maybe an hour after you've taught it, they forget about it. And you might think to yourself, well, well, why is this even worth doing? Well, in fact, again, in the moment, they enjoy that experience of learning. And even if they forget about it later, it almost doesn't matter. You, you've given them joy and happiness and interest in the moment. And of course, you've also learned, you've also had this connection with them. So take advantage of this with your family member, if at all possible. And, and as we think about the pandemic, you know, you may be in a situation where you're not living with your family member, maybe because of COVID and social distancing, you can't really go in and give them a big hug and, and, and be with them. You might be, uh, you know, again, in a quarantine situation. So I like to say that even though we, we ideally would be taking someone out to lunch and taking a long walk with them and, you know, sitting with them for a whole hour, that there's also a lot we can do in what I like to call 30 second activities. You know, a minute here, a minute there, it does add up. So if your family member is in assisted living or maybe you don't live with them and you can't really be with them all that much, maybe you're just Zooming with them, you know, still these one and two minute interactions are powerful. So greet the person by his or first name, you know, use their first name, talk about nicknames, eye contact, smiles. Um, you know, as a family member, I can step back and lower my mask and smile and wave and talk, or you can certainly do that on a Zoom call. Tell someone they're loved, give lots of compliments to them. Uh, again, a compliment just takes a few seconds and lifts the person's spirit. Asking an opinion, hey mom, I know we're on this Zoom call together. Do you like this new shirt I bought? Do you think this is a good color on me? When you ask somebody their opinion, it shows that they're valued. So again, remember that even if you are stressed and busy and managing children's education at home, uh, you can do these little 30 second activities. At Trilogy, the staff are taught that activities are more than just what is on the calendar, that these little one minute, two minute interactions also add up to a lot of connection during the day. And of course, we've alluded to Zoom and internet. We're all doing this as well. Uh, keep connected to the person the best you can. I know that some people living with dementia, their visual spatial processing or their attention spans are short. Uh, this may not work all that well, but give it a shot. You know, uh, if your family members in Wichita, Kansas or Walla Walla, Washington or Maine, 
you know, do your best to connect with them. As even, even a short call can be very helpful. And one family member told me that, you know, mom just didn't really do all that well with the uh, visual medium of Zoom or Google Meet. And they've just gone to the old fashioned phone calls and just phony mom, this can be very, very good. But do try to stay in, in connection with your family member. And certainly around the country, most uh, retirement communities or assisted living, skilled nursing settings uh, are arranging sessions so that you can Zoom with your, your family member if they are in residential care. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, have some fun with Zoom or with the internet and, and take some armchair travels uh, with your family member. You'll learn some things too. So as we begin, begin to think about you know, memory care today, I guess I just want to reframe things a bit for you. We've talked so much about social distancing. And yet this is very troubling and very challenging for a person with dementia because we want to be social with them. We, we want to be connected. We want to show our affection and do things with them and keep them busy. So what I'm so pleased to, to think with you about is, is just this idea of reframing. And I know, I know my friends at Trilogy are very much uh, supportive of this, this idea that maybe it isn't just social distance, it's sociable distancing or socially distancing. Uh, this idea of having some fun, what a wonderful slide, this team on the left, where they have their kind of activity card and snacks and they're being playful and fun. And, and again, you know, bringing some life down the hall as they talk to people. And of course, being out of doors um, can be very, very uh, easy to do. And, and it gives you that natural vitamin D and sunshine and fights depression. And perhaps depending on where you live and the various rules, you can, you can socially distance with your family member on a nice, uh, nice day in fall here. As we begin to wind down our webinar today, uh, I wanna reflect on some COVID-19 considerations and some of the lessons we've learned so far from this pandemic. I'm very impressed that Trilogy understands that as we look at all these heavy issues, it's not the medical model versus the social model. It's not one or the other, it can be both. We can give good health care. We can keep people as safe as possible during these challenging times, but still be a best friend, still enjoy music, art, exercise, still foster happiness and connection. This is so important. Dementia care at a distance can be successful. And now let me give you some recommendations for right now. Take this time to learn all you can about caregiving and dementia. Because of our new virtual world, you can sign on to a webinar from Alaska or New York or Florida. The amount of educational materials available online has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. So do all you can to learn about how to be an effective caregiver. And I wanna encourage you to make a plan after the pandemic so that you don't have to wait and wait and wait to use services as they become available. We know that socialization is so important. And if you try to do everything by yourself, uh, you might end up in a situation where you and your family member are isolated. So do your research and be aware that if there is a local day center or in-home provider or assisted living community that's going to be supportive of you, uh, do your research and make a game plan to utilize these services when, when they do open up. For now, let me leave you with a few recommendations that I hope will be very helpful for you as a family member. With the world having gone virtual, there are webinars, seminars, workshops from the Alzheimer's associations from major universities almost every week. So be sure to learn all you can about dementia during this time and take advantage of many of these educational offerings. And of course, thank you for being part of this one today. Uh, as you think about the future, identify services that can be helpful and, and think about creating a game plan to utilize that service, whether it's a, a very good in-home provider or adult day center, or of course, an assisted living community. And, and as you identify them, be aware that many family members fall into a, a bit of a, of a mistake where they wait and wait and wait to use services. Uh, don't do that because again, services can help a care partner successfully travel the journey and of course provide this needed important care and socialization for your family member living with dementia. Of course Trilogy through its daily rhythms and BFF program engages and promotes wellness for those living with memory loss and they'll be a very good resource for you if you need information and services. A few reflections to leave you with. What a person with dementia needs is a friend, a best friend from Virginia Bell, the co-founder of the Best Friends Approach. 
And a, a, a wonderful leader in the field from London, England, a, a renowned geropsychiatrist, Dr. Nori Graham says that, you know, Alzheimer's disease care, maybe it's about informed love. And you can see from this picture, the wonderful connection between a trilogy staff member and a resident, this idea of, of love, affection, engagement is so therapeutic for the person living with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. You can learn more about the Best Friends Approach at my website, bestfriendsapproach.com. And any of you who are on Facebook, you can like the Best Friends Approach on Facebook and get lots of good articles and, and updates and information that way. Again, thank you to my friends at Trilogy for hosting this webinar. Trilogy is where families come to live. Every component of the BFF program is designed to make our legacy residents feel supported, loved, and valued, because at the end of the day, they're not just our residents, they're our family. You can learn more about the BFF program by visiting TrilogyBFF.com. If you have any questions, you can use the link below to ask them. I wanna thank you all very much for being part of this webinar and traveling the journey with me and so many other people throughout the country who are doing their best to be there for the person with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have so many wonderful professionals who are giving of themselves during this time. Uh, I look forward to celebrating uh, the end of COVID when that happens, hopefully very soon. But meanwhile, thank you very much for uh, understanding the importance of keeping our family members with Alzheimer's disease and dementia engaged in life and as healthy as they can be.